Home. Now, uh, who's got a property down south or uh, wherever? A couple of people, that's good, because some of this stuff will apply down south as well. Uh, let's start at the beginning. Um, how many wieners do you envisage that uh, you will be applying best practice management to? Have you got an idea? But by the way, by the way, last time I came up for a beef up forum in 2010 in February, it was flooding then as well. So you should have more beef up forums, okay? <laughs> have you got an idea of that? We want to manage them, but we, how many are we going to have? Do we expect? Does anyone know what their losses are between pregnancy testing and, um, and weaning? 10%. 10%? Good. You, you, you preg test? Good. Because that's probably the best way of knowing. Uh, when cash cow happened, Alice Springs is a bit like Tasmania. You got left out of cash cow for some reason. Uh, when you draw the map of Australia, you always put Tassie in as well. Um, but so we didn't get any information much on breeder performance or calf loss in uh, the Alice Springs area. If you want to teach, uh, what's the old saying is, Feed a man fish, oh, sorry, feed a person fish and you feed them for a day. Teach them how to fish and you feed them for a lifetime. What today is I want to show you about the tips and tools in the MLA toolbox. Some of these are fresh off the press. You won't have had them before or you might not have seen them. Uh, calf loss, do I have a problem? Do I have a problem? And that's, that's in the toolbox. I won't talk too much about these tools because I, talking about, you'll, you'll forget about what you've heard. I want to show you where this stuff is so you can go back and look up the toolbox and find out more yourself. If, if you see dead calves, not a problem. You know you've got a calf loss. How many people see dead calves? I mean, how many people see 100 dead calves out of 1,000 breeders? That's 10% loss. How many people see that? You don't see the dead calves. So a lot of times you don't know you've got a problem. If you preg test, you do. You know, preg test, you keep all your pregnant ones and the next year you come back and you've got calves missing, you've got a fair idea. If you don't preg test though, and this is not all about preg testing because I don't know, a lot of people don't preg test and it's hard to justify when you haven't got a market for your empty cows and all this sort of stuff, but there are still techniques you can use to work out calf loss if you don't preg test and one is to look at the condition score and the udder secretions. When you get them in, strip the milk out. If it's got watery flex in it, milky flex in it, she could have, calf, she could have lost a calf, especially if it's in body condition score less than three and she's got watery looking milk in her secretions. Uh, if she's a big fat dry cow, probably didn't have a calf last year. I tried to find what work was done in the Alice Springs area on calf loss now. Our chair here did some work in 2007. Uh, where's, our, where's our button here? To, oh, something happened. We've got, we got a pointer? Right at the top. Oh, here we go. Where, where about? Yeah, it did work. It came up. Oh, right. Oh, right, eh? I think maybe it's not showing on the screen. It was showing on the wall. Not showing on the wall. Wait a minute. Come prepared. <laughs> no, I got my I got my own. I got two pointers now. Oh, there it is. No, that's mine. Oh. <laughs> Been doing this too long. Okay, this is some work Tim did, and they found uh, somewhere four percent, twelve percent loss. N not a lot compared to some other places, I tell you. Uh, Josnell did some work as well, uh, and. Uh, this is from work from a couple of properties that she didn't actually work on, but she got the data from old work that was done, I think. 13% and 9% calf loss. What causes calf loss? Look in the toolbox, look in the toolbox. There's a new fresh tips and tools out on what causes calf loss. There are a lot of factors, and these were isolated from a cash cow. If she lactated, if she lactated in the last year or not. So, 
big fat cow that comes through that hasn't got a calf on her, fair chance she won't have a calf on her again. She might look pretty in the, in the paddock, but she's probably better off in JBS or, or down at T's. Uh, body condition score, pregnancy diagnosis, if she was pretty poor, fair chance she's uh, going to lose a calf or, or had more chance of losing. Calf age is an important one. These are probably no-brainers, really. Heifers are your worst. Maiden heifers lose the worst, uh, have the worst calf loss. And old cows, probably no-brainers. And of course, this is a no-brainer as well, mustering around calving. You don't have to be Einstein to work out when they've got choppers in driving cows a long distance to yards, you're going to lose calves. And uh, I don't know what you can do about that. Must trapping. Heat stress is another one. Phosphorus deficiency, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Phosphorus deficiency doesn't cause calf loss. It causes decreased condition score in your cows, which causes calf loss. Bottle teats. That's a good one because if you don't see your cow when she calves, she can have big bottle teats. Three weeks later after she's lost the calf, the teat will be back to normal. So it does cause loss, but it's a bit hard sometimes to cull those cows if you don't see them at the time. But it was certainly shown to cause losses in the CRC work. Country type, well, northern forest was the worst uh, sent in the cash cow stuff, so country type was uh, those far places up north. And a lot of that probably could be due to uh, who knows? Karen's going to talk about this. There's some diseases out there. Akabani wasn't talked about. In cash cow, we don't know. We don't know what problem Akabani causes. Uh, if you've got three-day sickness here, you could have Akabani. If you don't see dead calves, it causes curly calf syndrome. If you see a calf twisted and bent, it's because it could be Akabani. They, they're born alive, they can't walk. Uh, a couple of projects I looked at, one on Lake Nash, another one up in... Uh, they didn't find any of these problems, but they did find problems with Akabani. Or well, they found Peters, put it that way. We still haven't got the work. And mismothering. And dystocia. If we start selecting for big growth rates in our bulls, then we're going to have a problem with calving in our heifers especially. And, uh, and it's mainly heifers, because you can't get a 45 kilogram heifer out of a a pelvis that's big, it's only a yearling or two year old heifer because they're not big enough. Then there's calf factors. Shade, calf birth weight was important. Um, they found it low birth weight in the CRC herds was a problem, but also big birth weight. Big birth weight, if a heifer's taken 12 hours to get a calf out, fair chance he's going to be exhausted and buggered by the time he's out, you know. So big birth weight's a problem as well. Wild dogs, um, Respiratory diseases, navel ill, five in one vaccine, uh, five in one clostridial diseases, animal husbandry procedures, all these are causing, some of these are causing losses at branding, not, not at birth. A lot of your calf loss is at birth. Vitamin A deficiency, well, if we didn't have Turac research, we still would be wondering uh, what that causes, but uh, if you haven't, if you've gone through a severe drought and you've got no top feed, no green feed, you'll get a vitamin A deficiency. They lost 40% in a research herd on Turek. It was only because a pathologist went up and did the autopsies that we actually were able to diagnose that. Genetic disorders. Oh, have you heard this one? Uh, there's a D, this virus here called coronavirus. Has anyone heard of that? <laughs> it affects calves as well. And it's been around before last year. Uh, and if you're into Wagyu's, it's a big problem uh, in Wagyu, so you need to probably uh, vaccinate your cows if you've got a calf loss problem. Can I ask why? It's bigger in Wagyu? I don't know. They probably, I don't know. Wagyu's got little, <laughs> little calves. Uh, I just know that when I went into an ET program, I had to vaccinate my cows, so they had immunity to pass on to the calves through the colostrum, and uh, that was part of the deal of going in this embryo transfer program. And Clostridium perfringens type E, that was a problem when I came to the Territory as a boy. I was sent up to the Barclay Tablelands to do work on this project, but BTEC consumed me. We've never got back to it, but there was big losses on the Barclays uh, in the late 60s. And it was during the wet season at the end. It wasn't, it wasn't your typical drought 
E. coli scours, it was killing him in the hot wet when there was plenty of lush feed around. They actually, it was an interesting story, we haven't got time for it. They had to send the samples over to the Perbright. So there's coronavirus vaccine. Uh, how to do a calf necropsy? Well, if you find dead calves, that's the best thing. Get them into the lab. Uh, you can do an autopsy that we can take you through some. Now, if you do an autopsy on a dead calf, it's just fresh dead. Watch out for mum, because they can be dangerous. And, uh, but, so there's a tips and tools there, how to do a necropsy, or, or an autopsy, or a post-mortem. Uh, if you're having doubts, put it in an ESCII and bring it into the lab here and uh, get it done professionally. But it's worth doing. And of course, all this will be done in NB2. Who's here from the lab? <laughs> yeah, well, Alice Springs used to be the hub for research and, and uh, whatnot many years ago. I don't know what happens now with her. I think it all goes to Berrimer, but uh, yeah, so you do have problems. NV2, you've all heard about that. Uh, they'll be looking at some of these issues on calf loss. Now, I was talking about wieners in the yard. They gave Desiree the best topic, which was nutrition. So I've got to fill in the spaces. Husbandry procedures, we'll talk about quickly health, welfare, future productivity. In the toolbox, in the toolbox, this is an old one, old tool, but it's a good tool. If you're having backpackers and new employees in your firm uh, and you're teaching them how to castrate uh, and there are losses, we'll talk about them quickly, uh, then they need how to do it properly. And this is a good little instruction book. It'll take you through the right procedures. Pain relief. Who's using pain relief? No one? That's okay. I mean, I didn't used to use a local anaesthetic when I spayed before either, but now I do because we've moved on and I feel that I wouldn't dare do it now. Rip a hole in the cow's side and rip out the ovaries, but we, and it'll get, animal welfare will become a big issue. And if you want to sell your beef and brand your beef as welfare friendly, then you probably consider these things. Now, people have used them, and I was a bit apprehensive about it, but they say that the calves do go back and mother up quicker, and it's expensive, but now the price of beef is good. But it's something you might want to consider. There's trisolvin, which is the local anaesthetic stuff you put on, and then there's this buccalgesic, which is the, which is the long-term analgesic after the operation. Tetanus, who uses five in one? Probably no one. That's okay. I had a, a big producer in North Queensland ring me up. He'd lost over 100 head of calves with tetanus, and you can tell because they go shaky, and the third eyelid comes across. Uh, and of course, he had the problem because the, vac the recommendation is do them before you castrate them. Now, who can do that? Who can do that? You can't. But I said, do it, do it when you do the procedure because it takes 10 days for that organism to develop. By the time they start to develop toxins, you will get some uh, immunity from the vaccine. So we did that. Uh, the other thing is it's very cheap. And, and, and the third thing is, if you've got feed, cattle going into a feedlot, they will need pulpic kidney, and that's all in five in one. Every feedlot, in Australia would use five-in-one vaccine on induction to stop pulpy kidney because they're going onto a grain diet and they, and they can die out in the paddock. CRC results. Now this is where they did not CRC, you all know about that. Research station results is very good because you get accurate data. They lost 20% of their calves. This is on a research station where they're supposed to be doing it properly uh, and they would have. Uh, from after branding. How many people know how many calves they lose after branding? Do you have an idea? When they did the mortality rate study in uh, breeders, one of the things they found was up to 7% of males go missing or calves go missing after branding. Do you know how many you lose? And these, these were in the research station, they were entire bulls, so they weren't even cut. So these are only from dehorning. These are only from dehorning. De 
Uh, oh, Tim comes up again. He's done a bit of work around the place, Tim. <laughs> uh, pestivirus. Uh, it's around. It's a very interesting disease. Uh, and I, I would think that most people would have it. I don't know. I don't know. Have you tested? But from the results that Tim did of the 13 properties in his HEFA trial, I think it was a HEFA trial, wasn't it, Tim? No, that was... Um, another, uh, another trial. HEFA's end from the vet lab as well. Righto. 100% prevalence in the herds and up to 63% prevalence in the thing. Hello. It's not a new disease. It's not a new disease. 1967, that was before Leonard Teal left homicide. Uh, Toby St George came through. 92% positives. All herds had some level of pestivirus. You've lived with pestivirus. It, don't get me wrong, it can be a serious problem. And if you've got a stud, you really have to vaccinate because if you're selling bulls, you have to be able to guarantee that they're, they're, they're clean or vaccinated. Uh, in the toolbox, you'll find a, a wiener management in northern herds. This is an eight pager. Uh, and that's online too. And that'll go through a lot of the stuff on nutrition and wiener management that we've talked about. So why do we wean? You only wean to manage the condition of the cow. Now, uh, the late Ted Hayes told me once, cows get too fat if he weans. Now, that's in a good season, of course. And that's right. So it's all about managing the cow. And weaning does nothing for the calf. Absolutely nothing. If you want to win prize at the show, you always leave your, your bullock on the spade jersey cow for a while, for two years. So you can reduce the amount of supplementary feeding. You can maximise, if you leave it too late before she calves again, you will, you will affect that milk production the following thing, following um, lactation. It's a chance to educate and train your young cattle. Um, and you can sort them out according to their weights and you can market them. Now, this is where if you've got feedlots down south or you're targeting steers, and the beauty about today's thing is if you run into drought, you can get rid of a lot of your steers to feedlots. And you can, you, it hurts to feed cattle during a drought hay, and you don't know how long the drought's going for. This is work Kev Sullivan did. He's a big uh, consultant in the feedlot industry in Eastern Australia. This is yard weaning, and this is daily growth rates. Now, they always make these graphs look worse than they are, but there's about a, a point, whatever it is, 1.1 to 1.3 difference in growth rates in those that were only paddock weaned versus those that were yard weaned. Why the difference? Well, the yard weaned cattle are trained, they've probably been vaccinated and they're socialised and they've also been introduced to rations. Okay? So that's just on growth rate. Also in sickness, there's less sickness. Less sickness because pestivirus because it's a fertility disease, but it also causes depression of the immune system. And when you get cattle coming into a feedlot, like it's uh, like one of those cruise ships, the Ruby, Ruby Princess, uh, you've got a big chance for disease interaction. And so if they've got pestivirus, they get a fever, just like the flu, then they get pneumonia. And that's what socialisation does uh, and bring them together and keep them in their, their background, and they call it, down south. Um, so a lot of feedlots background before they go into the feedlot. I first noticed this when I went to Turkey uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I was working in a feedlot there. These were young Frisians. They'd come together and they'd spend the first week just riding each other. It's socialisation. It's nothing to do with sex. It's about dominance. And, of course, the, the uh, feedlot managers w wanted to turn off some cattle out of the pens, so they, they boxed the empty pens. Some of the empty pens they boxed together. And that's when I realised the importance of socialisation, and it happens in our cattle as well. So when you bring in strange mobs of cattle together, they have to go through all this process of working out who's the boss and who's, who's in charge of the show. So what happened here was, uh, we grouped these cattle here, they're all doing about 0.9 kgs, for the first whatever days, 125. These that we reboxed, when we, when we sold the balance of them, 
Because why would you want half empty pens in a feedlot? Doesn't make sense. So you box them all together, makes common sense, doesn't it? Well, hello, about a 34.34 kg difference in a day in their growth rates. And that worked out to nearly 8,000 kilograms. You can work out the price of that. We did do, we did do good bulls. Wild dogs, uh, I don't know. Who's got a problem with dogs and who baits? Everyone baits. I was involved with the first baiting program on the Barclay Tablelands and dogs did cause a problem. We had to get the chief minister up. Well, he, I don't think he was then. He was Slim Tuxworth came out to Brunchilly and we had a hundred wieners bitten and chewed. And if you've got evidence of chewed ears, uh, you've got a problem. But I was at a rangelands conference last month in Longreach where some producers don't bait at all. So we've got no, have we got any no, no baiters here? Because they feel that baiting keeps their kangaroos down. And Ken Shaw, does anyone remember Ken Shaw? Yeah. He went and bought a property over at Kunyai on the Great Western Desert. He didn't bait for 20 years for that very reason. He'd have roo shooters come out and they'd shoot 200 a, year, a, a night. In the end, uh, they were only getting about two or three. He did then change his mind and start baiting again, but it's, it's a balancing act and really something you've got to work out yourself. That's a great picture, sort of the dogs living next to the Toxic plants, uh, there's plenty of toxic plants in Central Australia. The main thing is when you're handling wieners or any strange cattle, fill them up with hay, good hay, before you let them out of the yards. I've seen too many cases just on cooch grass, wilted cooch grass, killing wieners had gone to Windy because they were starved for a couple of yard, days in the yard, got out, hoed into this wilted cooch grass, uh, which is cyanide, and rolled them. Worms, we talked about worms, well, Matt Playford did. I don't know whether you've got a worm problem here in Alice Springs or not. Uh, Jocelyn's uh, found some significant egg counts. Uh, the main one here would be Barber's Pole. It's very easy to, to diagnose. It's only going to be a problem in some years, and this year could be a year when you've got, if you've got high stocking rates on green pick, barber's pole can be a big problem. Most of your problem is on the pastures, not in the cattle, on the pastures. Because these, these fellows lay thousands and thousands of eggs, and if you've got high stocking rates in, in little paddocks, that's when they're going to pick up. Uh, and so you need to have, bear in mind that it can cause a problem. Uh, I don't know whether there's a problem here, but on, in a project we did on the Barclay Table in the Stuart Plateau, um, the Northern Territory Government and MLA, we had significant egg counts of 500 to 1,000. If that was down south, you would be treating those animals. And these are the properties, 11 properties. And we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven properties had significant egg counts in some of the wieners. And even worse, one, two, three properties had more than a thousand and they were homongous. Is homongous causing a problem? Should it be treated? I don't know. You, you can do faecal egg counts. I don't know whether you do them at the lab here or not, but you can probably do them yourself at home with a little toy microscope. It's not rocket science if you want to go down that track. All I'm saying is keep an eye on it. Phosphorus. That's the map. It's not a real good picture. That's Alice Springs. Here's Tennant Creek. There's a, lot, a fair bit of red there, but there's a lot of green and yellow as well. Have you got a problem? Have you got a problem with phosphorus? There's no silver bullets in the beef industry, but this is one. If you're, if you're genuinely in a red area and not supplementing, then this could be a silver bullet for you. We didn't get too many samples from the PIP challenge and I realise it's hard to get blood collected these days. We don't have the same facilities to be able to go out and collect blood. And it's a real big issue trying to get blood in, even in Queensland. We had trouble <laughs> around Bark and the Long Reach getting people to take blood because you've got to rely on vets. This was a pen trial. And this is when, I, when, the, when the light bulb, my road to Damascus moment with phosphorus hit me when I saw this graph. These were five different levels of phosphorus. Uh, these are on a positive plane of nutrition, green grass-like. Look at the difference in weight, 60, versus 60 kgs over 12 weeks. 
And then can you tell the difference in the steers? That's high and low. So it's affecting young cattle post weaning, especially when they're growing. Now this is Tim's trial. You've probably seen it. Kidman Springs. Had to be called off. You can probably see the difference here, I don't know. Slide good enough? 370, you might see that, 370 kgs versus 400. It's a fair bit of weight, fair bit of weight. I might have to go on a phosphorus deficient diet myself. <laughs> These are his results. Look at the difference in weights, 120. Difference in pregnancy rates, 25%. Difference in weaner weights, that's only because the cow's making more milk, 34 kgs. And the mortality rates ended up in 11% difference. This is a slide I really love. The controls were fed 24, $24 worth of supplement each a year. Is that right, Tim? They got the extra $10. This makes you think about how you spend your supplement dollar, surely? Surely, if you've got a phosphorus deficiency, it, it'll pay you to go out and feed phosphorus. And you can see the intakes there. That's another question. We'll, well, I don't want to get bogged down. <laughs> Look, we were feeding rock phosphate 50 years ago without a problem. I don't, we'll, talk, we'll talk after lunch on that. <laughs> it depends what you're using. I mean, there is difference in quality about the availability and whatnot here. But the main message on phosphorus is it decreases feed intake in growing cattle over the wet season when they're growing. It's like eating... Uh, eating green grass without phosphorus is like eating fries without salt. And all the benefits come from being able to eat. Sure, you get peg leg. What happens now, though, is you don't see... Who's seen peg leg? OK, have you seen it anymore? You, you put phosphorus in the dry season leg. So that stops you getting peg leg. But the big benefit from phosphorus is feeding it over the wet. Because that's when you put the, the weight on. That's when you can get the weight into the cows to go into the next dry season. The potty calf, they're certainly worth feeding now. And there's a fair bit in that nutrition manual and that's that eight pager on looking after potty calves. Uh, over at Headingley a few years ago when they had a Gidgey problem, Sandy Hagen had 600 potty calves in the yard. Well worth the effort though. Uh, once upon a time you wouldn't do it. Denk of it was $120 a bag. But now that the whole game has changed, me myself, I couldn't afford to buy cattle anymore. I bought some magpies. <laughs> and uh, I'm, in, I'm involved in this little project called Dairy to Beef. And these little fellas have put on 150 kg since May. So I'm pretty wrapped. <laughs> so if you've got a property down south and you get some magpies and cattle are too dear, get into them as well. <laughs> Finally, I had to do a job for Ridley's earlier this year to look at what would I do if I fed supplement to my first calf heifers, what's the economics of it? I went back and I looked at all the papers on, on uh, supplementation, on true protein, and hello, the biggest impact was feeding a, a protein supplement to your weaners. And when I went back and looked at, right back to Steve Petty's work on Flora Valley when he did all this early weaning project, he actually made this statement saying, you get your biggest impact from feeding protein uh, you be, and less, less compensatory gain after weaning. Because we always thought, I always thought, I don't know what you thought, you don't get, you get compensatory gain, it's not worth feeding. But hello, then I went back and had a look at this Catherine work uh, just two years ago, where they fed five levels of protein to weaners. And yeah, look at the difference. And yeah, you do get some compensatory gain, but hello, there was about a, a 40 to 50 kg difference. I modelled that because that makes a big difference. If you can get your weaners coming off at 180 and you can get 60 kgs on them over the dry season before the wet comes, how heavy is that? 240. So if you get a normal wet, you can get them on the boat first year. Change the whole dynamics of the herd because you're getting your steers off earlier. But not only that, you're getting your heifers you're getting your heifers up to their weights around about 350 kgs to mate and you're getting better conception rates and you're getting better fertility in the first calf heifers as well. 
And uh, this is what I found, hot off the press. And you might think I can't afford the supplementation because of freight. Well, hello, at $600 a kg, uh, and at current prices, in a 10,000, we're making $122,000 extra. And this was very conservative modelling, I might add. So when you get up into the high supplement costs, it probably didn't pay. But at current beef prices, up around somewhere here, if we can get our supplement, we, we can start to talk. And, and you need to do your sums yourself. Um, and the, the exciting thing is, they're growing cotton in the top end. There is no better stock feed than cotton seed, whole cotton seed. And if you can tap into that, uh, you're on the winner. Now, the other, finally, before I close, uh, this is a, a tool in the box too, where you can look at your protein supplement. You can put the price of your supplement in here. Uh, where is it? Price of supplement goes in there for your protein meal. You put your wiener weights in, what sort of growth rate you want. You've got to have pastures, you've got to have pastures. Uh, and you can work out your cost again. So that was in 2002, don't look at that. 2021, our protein meal was $800, K, $800 a tonne I put in, and we're putting in 240 kg steers, and we can get this sort of growth rate on protein supplement if they're eating 0.5% body weight, which is not that much. That's what we magpies are doing. Um, our our cost, of, cost of gain is two, uh, is, 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 is a, $1.37.6 in protein to put on a kilogram of live weight. How much are you getting for your live weight now? You start to rethink about how you, how you change your operation and what you're feeding and uh, where you're going with your project. Certainly if you can get your cattle off steers down south or whatever, uh, or even got facilities here, even with the price of freight, it's worth looking at. Questions? Just on time. <coughs> More of a comment just from a question that you're talking about that trisulfan and the five in one vaccines and a lot of organic producers in this area. We'd love to do it, but we just we can't get the organics to agree to it. Especially oh like yeah, vaccine. yep, and, and same with same with coccidia. I meant to mention that. If you've got coccidiosis, and which you will have if you're doing early weaning, uh, it's like um, yeah, it's like dogs and fleas. Um, you can't use remensin. No, no. So you've got, you got a few problems there with organic. I mean, this is the place to do organic, don't get me wrong, if you can do it. But it does cause a few issues, yeah. No. You've got no tick. No. You got no... Well, please thank Jeff for his talk. And, uh...